Amen, indeed. Well, good morning, officially, Trinity Church family, and welcome to those of you who might be joining us for the first time, as we are uh, beginning a new series today entitled The Reach of God's Redemption, looking together at the book of Jonah over the next five Sundays. And so if you've got a Bible, I just invite you right now to turn right to Jonah 1. We're going to jump right into this very famous fist story. Uh, Here's how it begins. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now, my guess is that a lot of us have heard this Jonah story one way or another. Uh, But to really understand the significance of what God is asking Jonah to do here in going to the city of Nineveh, I want to give you a little bit of background information about this guy Jonah and this city Nineveh. So let me first give you some historical context about this guy Jonah first. Uh, Jonah is only mentioned in the Old Testament once outside the story, and it's in an obscure little passage in 2 Kings, uh, which is a very important scripture because it provides us with a clue as to who Jonah was before this fish story took place. It also tells us why Jonah might have been reluctant to obey God's call to go to the city of Nineveh. So uh, I might even encourage you to make a note. Uh, If you're a note taker, if you've got your Bible out and you like put notes in your Bible, I'd put something in the margin next to Jonah 1 that says, see 2 Kings 14.25 for background information about this guy Jonah. Well, here's what 2 Kings 14.25 says. It says this, King Jeroboam II, this was one of the, Israel's kings, King Jeroboam II, was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Dead Sea in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hefer. Now, this 2 Kings scripture gives us two really, really important pieces of information about this guy Jonah. If you're following along in your notes, here's the first really important key piece of information about Jonah. It tells us that Jonah was a prophet appointed by God. Uh, Jonah here is called a servant of God, which is really important to note because Jonah's disobedience in this fish story is so like legendary uh, that we have this idea that Jonah was just this rogue. He was just this renegade. He was just this, you know, kind of foolish guy, right? I know he had the title prophet, but maybe he was one of those self-appointed prophets, you know, those Guys who are standing on street corners, or sometimes they land on TV, right? This is not a self-proclaimed, self-appointed prophet. This is a prophet appointed by God. He's called a servant of God. He's been a faithful witness. He's been God's servant doing whatever God called him to do, at least up until Jonah chapter 1. This verse in 2 Kings also tells us something else about Jonah. Uh, It tells us that Jonah's primary job as God's prophet before being called to Nineveh had been to prophesy the expansion of Israel's national borders. Let me read that verse for you again so you can hear it. Uh, King Jeroboam II was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath all the way to the Dead Sea in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah. This is really, really significant because prophesying the expansion of Israel's national borders was a message that the people of Israel would have undoubtedly loved, right? This would have played to their nationalistic pride, right? You're a person who lives in Israel. You're hearing this prophet come along and saying, God wants to expand our borders, right? It's like manifest destiny. This is a good message. It's good to be a prophet when God calls you to give that message to the people of God, right? And we know that Jonah's prophecy about Israel's borders expanding came true. In the 8th century BC, Israel defeated their enemies. Their borders were expanded just like Jonah predicted. So on the one hand, Jonah was a proven prophet with a record of rightly predicting what would happen. On the other hand, this is what I want you to think about. On the other hand, it's easy to see how Jonah could have slipped into thinking that God's international policy was to bless Israel but condemn Israel. Israel's political enemies. Right? It would have been very easy for someone whose primary message was the expansion of Israel's borders to come to believe that God's international policy was to bless Israel but condemn Israel's political enemies. And speaking of political enemies, uh, let me tell you something about the Ninevites. 
the Assyrian Empire, one of the most notorious of Israel's enemies. And let me preface by saying that I will be dialing back the gory details I could tell you about the Ninevites. But I do want to tell you enough about the Ninevites so that you get a picture of how ruthless, how godless, how cruel they were, so that you can understand the dilemma that Jonah was facing when God called him to go there. As I said, Nineveh was the flagship city of the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrians, if you're following along in your notes, the Assyrians had a reputation, an unprecedented reputation for being ruthless to whomever they took over. In fact, it was a reputation that they were proud of. The Assyrians actually wrote down their violent exploits for posterity. And in fact, archaeologists have discovered carvings and tablets de depicting what the uh, Assyrians did to their victims, which I will not be showing on PowerPoint this morning. But within these records, there's bragging of dismemberment, where the Ninevites would leave one hand of their victims attached so that they could mockingly shake it just before the person died. Right? They would then decapitate their victims and force the family members of the deceased to carry their heads on poles in a parade-like march. They also boasted of stretching prisoners out with ropes so that they could skin them alive. And then the game was to see how long they could keep their skinned victims alive. And again, I'm not even sharing with you the most gruesome stories of their brutality. But suffice it to say, the Assyrians were a ruthless people with no regard for God and certainly no regard for Israel. So you can imagine how Jonah must have felt when God called him to go to Nineveh. Right? It's hard to even think of a modern day comparison, but the one that I was thinking about is that you know, maybe it would be like God calling you know, someone of us to go preach to ISIS. Right? God here is calling Jonah to go to Israel's enemy that was most notorious for its violence and its torture. But here's the thing to keep in mind, and you'll, you'll note this as we walk through this story. Death was not the, like the worst possible outcome that Jonah could imagine for this mission. You're going to see this as the story unfolds, but, but Jonah was actually more concerned with this mission succeeding, succeeding than he was with this mission failing. Right? Think about it. What if the people of Nineveh had, Nineveh had repented? Right? How, how would he be viewed now by his fellow Israelites? Well, I know most likely how he would have been viewed. He would have been viewed as a Benedict Arnold, as a traitor. Right? Like, how, how, could, you go, how could you go to this, this brutal, ruthless, godless people and be the instrument for bringing them back into relationship with God so that now we share our relationship with God? He would have been viewed as a Benedict Arnold. No, it wasn't fear of dying that motivated Jonah to run away from God's calling. Jonah was not afraid to die. You're going to see that as we walk through this story. We're actually told why Jonah ran away from the Lord at the very end of the story. Sometimes you have to read the end of the story for the beginning of the story to make sense. So spoiler alert for those of you who don't know the story. Uh, Jonah eventually goes to Nineveh, and the Ninevites do repent. They do turn away from their evil. They do turn away from their violent ways, and they do turn to God. Now, some of you are like, you just gave away the story. Why should I even come back? Keep coming back, because there's a little more to the story that I think you're going to want to hear. But here's the thing about the Ninevites repenting, the Ninevites turning to God. Jonah is not happy about it at all. In fact, Jonah gives God an earful at the beginning of chapter 4. Listen to what Jonah says to God after the Ninevites repent and God forgives them. It says this, but to Jonah this seemed very wrong and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Right? Why is it that Jonah runs away from God's call to go to Nineveh? Well, according to Jonah himself, it's because Jonah didn't want anything to do with a plan that involved even the possibility of these wicked Ninevites getting in on God's grace. See, for Jonah, God's grace is fine as long as it's given to the right kind of people. But for Jonah, that couldn't possibly include the hated Ninevites. By the way, as someone once said, you can safely assume that you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. Right? That's a, that's a bad sign. You've created God in your own image. It, it reminds me of this Despair.com lithograph 
entitled Elitism. I don't know if you can see it, but on the poster, there's an eagle flying high above the clouds, and then the caption below it reads, It's lonely at the top, but it's comforting to look down on everyone at the bottom. Right? Some of you are like, I don't get it. Others of you are like, that's gold. I'm, I'm playing to the satirical, sarcastic crowd. Right? That's Jonah, right? Like, I'm one of God's prophets, right? It's lonely being a spiritual leader, but boy, it's comforting looking down on everyone. There's, there's this pride, this self-righteousness that's taken root in Jonah's heart. Jonah thought God's grace was just for him, just for God's people, his people, Israel. Jonah didn't want anything to do with a plan that involved even the possibility of Nineveh getting in on God's grace. So what does Jonah do in response to God calling him to Nineveh? He runs, and specifically, he runs to Tarshish. Listen again to verse 3. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. Now, what's significant about Tarshish? Well, uh, you'll notice on the screen behind me a map, right? Tarshish was considered to be as far west as you could go in the known Mediterranean world. Right? And as you can see, Tarshish and Nineveh, they're like on opposite sides of the map, opposite sides of the Mediterranean world, the, the known world. In other words, this is Jonah's attempt to get away from God, to get as far away from God's calling as he could possibly get, which of course is a futile attempt, right? Because God is the hound of heaven. Right? He's the hound of heaven. You can't run away from God. In the next verse, God sends a huge storm to rein Jonah in and to get Jonah's attention. Look at verse 4. It says, Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. So Jonah is now on a boat with a bunch of pagans. Right? They're calling out to their own God. I mean, they've got multiple gods here, they're, but they're desperate, and so they're calling out to their own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. Now, one would think that this storm, right, might jar Jonah into confessing and calling out to God. Like, he knows what's going on here, right? Y you might think that this might jar him to confess, to call out to God, but you know where Jonah is while these pagan sailors are frantically calling out to their own gods and trying to survive the storm? Jonah's below deck, sleeping. Look at the end of verse 5. It says this, but Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. Right? Jonah's all cozy and curled up below deck, sleeping through the storm. That's his fault. Biblical scholar Leslie Allen says, The storm that so alarmed the crew served only to rock Jonah into deeper slumber, blissfully unaware of all the trouble he's causing. By the way, isn't this what happens when we disobey God? Right? Not only do we fall into a, a spiritual slumber, but we cause trouble for other people who get caught in the spokes of our disobedience. In other words, there is no sin that, quote-unquote, only affects me. I know we live in a very individualistic society that wants to kind of privatize everything, like, this is my deal, it doesn't affect you. There is no such thing as a personal sin that affects only one person. Jonah's decision to run from God has now put these pagan sailors' lives in jeopardy too. And yet, in a twist of irony, it's actually the pagan captain who wakes up the prophet Jonah and tells him to start praying. Take a look at verse 6. The captain went to Jonah and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Again, he doesn't even know who this guy's God is, but it's like, hey, let's like have a diversified portfolio. Joe and Jim, and Jim, they're all calling on their gods. Get up. You've probably got a God. Like, call out, call out to him. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Again, this captain, he doesn't even know God, but he at least knows when it's time to pray. Jonah, on the other hand, knows God, but doesn't pray. Despite the storm, despite lives being at stake, not once in all of chapter 1 does Jonah pray. In fact, it's only after being interrogated that these sailors finally pry a confession of faith out of Jonah. Look at verse 7, you'll see what I mean. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let's cast lots to find out who's responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. God uses their pagan device to zero in on Jonah. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us, who's responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? 
And then Jonah answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. I want you to notice something here about Jonah's confession of faith. It's kind of code for, I know you all are, you know, Joe and Jerry and Jim, you're all worshiping your pseudo-gods, you know, like the God of the sea, the God of the porpoise, the God of the sea turtle, like, I'm worshiping the one who made it all. Right, that's what he says here. I, I worship, I worship the Lord, all caps in your Bible, right? The God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. So the sailors here, they finally pry out of Jonah this very brief, this very begrudging confession, but it's a significant confession, right? Because Jonah's confession here shows that he is totally orthodox in his knowledge of God. Jonah is doctrinally spot on. Jonah knows who the true God is, right? I worship the God who made it all. The reason that I point out Jonah's orthodoxy is this. Unfortunately, Jonah's orthodoxy doesn't lead to orthopraxy. Right? Orthodoxy is the right belief, orthopraxy, right living. Jonah's orthodoxy does not lead to orthopraxy. This is one of the major themes in this book, that despite Jonah's vast knowledge of God, it does not lead Jonah to obey God. And that's because Jonah is suffering from what some call the liar syndrome. Low information action ratio. Low information action ratio, the liar syndrome. The liar syndrome is where we take in lots of information about something, but without taking any action steps based on that information. And the liar syndrome, as you all know, is an epidemic in our culture, right? I mean, we're now accustomed to taking in vast amounts of information and really doing very little with it. I mean, think about all the information that we now have at our fingertips today, most of which we don't do anything with, even if we wanted to, right? Social media feeds, the news, most of what's on the internet. There are so many places in life now where we take in information and do nothing with it because we can't, such that now, even in those places where we can do something with the information, oftentimes we don't because we've been, quote unquote, trained not to. And that's not just an epidemic out there. That liar syndrome, it's, it's crept into the church too, right? Like we listen to sermons, we do Bible studies, we go to seminars, we go to conferences, we fill our bookshelves with good information. And yet oftentimes that information doesn't really translate into action. I've been guilty of this kind of thing. My guess is you have too. I mean, I know this kind of thing would never happen at Trinity Church, but here's the way that many American Christians for example, interact with the sermon on Sunday morning. Uh, in a word, we critique it. We critique it. We, we listen to the message and then we score it. Maybe not out loud. That would be kind of blunt. But we think to ourselves, that was a good sermon. Or that was a boring sermon. Or I like that illustration in the sermon. Or I think the pastor could have made that point differently. Or, Why does the pastor keep asking us to raise our hands all the time? Okay, you can take issue with that part, right? <laughs> but in other words, my point is this. We, we evaluate the message more often than applying the message, right? I, I know I've slipped into doing this kind of thing when I listen to podcasts of other teachers, but here's what should be going on in our minds when we hear God's word or when we listen to a message. The question is not, was that a good message? The question is, based on what I've just heard from God's word, is there any of it that I need to apply to my life? See, if we don't intentionally ask that question, we will become a people who know all the right answers about God, but whose lives don't really line up with God. We'll become like Jonah, someone whose orthodoxy doesn't really lead to orthopraxy. By the way, uh, this is why I almost always build in next steps at the end of the message. I, I don't want our church to fall prey to this liar syndrome, where we hear God's word and then leave without asking God if there's anything in his word that he wants us to apply to our lives. See, folks, it's one thing to, to know a lot about God. Jonah knew a lot about God. But it's another thing to trust God enough to act on whatever it is that he's calling us to. Again, the, uh, the irony of Jonah chapter 1 is that these pagan sailors knew almost nothing about God, and yet they, the pagan sailors, not Jonah, are the ones who act on what little spiritual information they had, what little spiritual truth they know. Notice the sailor's response when they find out that Jonah is a prophet of the Most High God. Verse 10, it says, this terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? 
they knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. And now they're asking him, what have you done? This is like the Lord who made it all? Like there is such a God? What have you done? The modern day equivalent of this is, are you nuts? Are you crazy? What are you thinking? What have you done? In other words, these pagans understand how to relate better to God than God's own prophet. I mean, if God tells you to do something, you do it, right? Look at verse 11. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. In other words, Jonah clearly understands the seriousness of his sin. He knows, as Paul says in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death. And that's why he says, pick me up and throw me overboard. He knows the wages of sin is death. He knows the just consequences for rebelling against the God of the universe is his skin. Throw me overboard, he says. He knows the just consequences for sin is death. But here's the thing that you also got to keep in mind. Jonah also knows, as I showed you in chapter 4, Jonah also knows that God is gracious, that God is slow to anger, that God is abounding in love. In other words, Jonah knew that he could have repented. He could have turned back to God. He could have repented, and he would have received God's forgiveness. He would have received God's gracious. He knew that. But Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Right? Jonah would rather die than go to Nineveh. Why? Because Jonah wants the Ninevites to get justice, not mercy. Jonah doesn't want to hear about God's love for the lost. God wants a God. Jonah wants a God of justice, right? Until next week, you'll find out that he's really ready to receive God's mercy when he's flailing in the Mediterranean Sea. Right? But that's next week. And next week, Jonah has a change of heart. He's crying out for mercy. Because mercy always sounds better than justice when we're the ones who need it, right? <laughs> but again, that's next week. For now, Jonah wants a God of justice. Jonah wants the Ninevites to die for their sin. And to prove it, he's willing to die for his. You know people who cut off their nose to spite their face? That's what's going on here. Jonah's like, throw me into the sea. I know that's the just consequences for sin, which is code for that's what the Ninevites should get to. Again, the irony is that these pagan sailors are better reflections of God's grace than Jonah. Look at how the sailors respond to Jonah's call to throw him overboard in verse 13. Instead, key word, instead of like, okay, well, that's his plan. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they couldn't, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Right? You see the irony here of these pagan sailors. They're trying to save Jonah's life. They're trying to save this guy's life who's made their voyage a complete train wreck, if I can mix my metaphors, right? Like, they weren't just on a sea cruise, like, for pleasure. This was, there's financial implications. Like, Jonah has sabotaged their trip. And they're still trying to save this dude's life. If you're following along in your notes, these pagan sailors show more compassion for one life, Jonah's life, than the prophet Jonah shows 120,000 lives. That's the population of the city of Nineveh. You'll find that out in chapter 3. Right? They show more compassion for one life than Jonah has on 120,000 lives. Don't miss the irony here. These sailors who do not know much about God at all actually display more compassion than Jonah, who knows a lot about God. Let me reiterate another point of irony in the story because it gets repeated in verse 14. While the prophet Jonah has been sleeping, these pagan sailors continue to pray. In fact, these pagan sailors who have not been praying to the real Lord, they've been praying to their pseudo-gods, right? We saw that earlier in the chapter. They've just now learned about the Lord, and they immediately begin calling out to the Lord, right? Not to, you know, John's and Jim's and Jerry's gods. They're now calling out to the Lord. Look at verse 14. You'll see what I mean. Then they cried out to the Lord. If you've got a Bible, you'll see that Lord is all caps, L-O-R-D, all caps. This is Yahweh. This is the personal God. This is the God who revealed himself to Moses, Right? This is the Lord. They are now crying out to the Lord, these pagan sailors, and they're saying this, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. These pagan sailors are now praying to the Lord. In fact, by the end of this chapter, you're going to see that these pagan sailors are worshiping the Lord. They're committing their lives to the Lord. 
See, Jonah 1 is this incredible picture of how people who don't yet have a relationship with God just might respond to God, just might convert to God, just might stop worshiping their pseudo-gods and turn to the real God if they're simply given an opportunity to hear about him. This reminds me of the summer I first learned this lesson. I was 21 doing an internship in inner city Detroit as a still very young follower of Jesus. And during one of the weeks of my internship, our church hosted a bunch of youth pastors, youth leaders, 800 students from all over Michigan who all converged on the city for five days to help plant three churches. And part of what we did that week was we prayed through these neighborhoods where these three churches were going to get planted, and we invited folks to come to one of those church plants during the week. Well, there was this moment when I sensed God calling me not just to invite some folks to one of the church plants, but to share the gospel with three of these teenagers who were hanging out on one of these street corners just up the block from where we were praying, just up the block from where we were inviting folks to come to one of these church plants. Truth be told, though, I was still very self-conscious about sharing my faith. I was still very insecure about sharing Christ with people. And so, to be honest, at first, I resisted. I was like, oh, that's probably not the Holy Spirit. That's probably something I ate, right? But God's persistent, right? Like, you know those times where he's like, he's just not letting you up, right? He's, he's persistent. Well, he was persistent with me, and he just kept impressing upon me to go share Christ with these three guys. And so, finally, I, I walked over to these guys, and I, I just said to them kind of sheepishly, I think God wants me to share something with you. Would that be okay? And I was kind of ready for them to kind of, like, write me off, like, get out of my business. And, and to my surprise, they were like, okay. Uh, at which point I proceeded to, to talk to them about Jesus. And, and at the end of what I shared, which was only probably three or four minutes, I, I asked them if they wanted to put their faith in Jesus as the Savior and as the Lord of their lives, the one who would like be in charge of their lives from here on out. And, and to be honest with you, I, I was not expecting these guys to respond positively to my brief, clunky, awkward, three-minute sermonette. Right? But all three of these guys, they bowed their heads right there on that street corner and prayed to receive Christ. And all three of them were like ready for me to connect them to one of the church planters who was going to be planting a church in their neighborhood. And I share this story so that you get this next point, folks. It was not because of my eloquence that these guys received Christ. I know that because it was just earlier that same year when I dropped out of my public speaking class because I was afraid of giving a speech, a five-minute speech, in front of 20 of my peers. Right? It was not my eloquence that move these guys' hearts to respond to God. No, it was because God was already at work in their hearts. God was already preparing them to hear his message, such that I simply needed to step into the flow of what God was already doing in their lives. See, folks, where God is already at work, it doesn't take an eloquent sermon to help someone come to faith in Christ. Right? Jonah 1 is this great reminder of how those who don't yet know God just might respond in faith if they're simply given an opportunity to hear about him. And think about the opportunity that these guys heard. It was not a great opportunity from our perspective, right? Like these sailors heard a very brief and begrudging confession of faith, right? They, they hear this brief begrudging confession of faith from Jonah about the God who made it all and something clicks in their hearts and they believe. Right? In fact, if they weren't already convinced about this God, at this point in the story, what happens next after they throw Jonah overboard seals the deal. Look at verse 15. You'll see what I'm talking about. Then they took Jonah and they threw him overboard and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to the Lord. So let me sum this up for you. God uses Jonah's begrudging statement of faith. It's like eight words long, right? This begrudging confession of faith, his forced confession of sin, and this miraculous calming of a storm to bring these non-Jewish pagans into a saving relationship with himself. That's what's just happened for these pagan sailors. They come into a saving relationship with God. Now, some of you are thinking I'm overstating the salvation of these sailors, but Give me a chance to unpack what's being said here in verse 16. Look at it again. Look at the beginning of verse 16. It says, At this the men greatly feared the Lord. Another translation is, they reverenced the Lord. In other words, this is worship language. The, the sailors are now reverencing God. They're now worshiping God. 
Now, if you're still inclined to think that these sailors worship as mere lip service, notice what the sailors do next in verse 16. It says, they offered a sacrifice to the Lord. In other words, this isn't just lip service religion, right? A sacrifice was this public acknowledgement of one's devotion to a particular God, and a sacrifice cost the worshiper something. In other words, this is, this is not some cheap grace conversion. The sailors here take action on the information they've just learned about God to the point where they are now putting their money where their mouth is. Right? It's a sacrifice. It costs them something. And then finally, in case you still think the sailors' conversion is just this momentary blip on their radar screen, notice what they did next in verse 16. It says, they made vows to the Lord. They made vows to the Lord. In other words, this was not just some private, emotionally charged moment. Right? The sailors here are publicly and corporately expressing their commitment to worship the Lord from here on out. They're making vows to him. Again, get the scene in your mind. Jonah, Jonah's got this brief and begrudging confession of faith. Right? How, how is that going to be helping these guys come to faith in God? But that's what God does. God uses Jonah's begrudging confession of faith, even his disobedience, right? Because it's his disobedience that gets him on this boat where God can now get these sailors into a saving relationship with himself. That's how amazing our God is. That's how amazing our God's grace is, that, that he can use anything to get a hold of the hearts of people who don't yet know him. See, one of the things you're going to see as we walk through this story is that the book of Jonah is not ultimately about Jonah. It's about God. It's about the reach of God's redemption. It's about how his purpose of reaching the world cannot and will not be thwarted. See, God, if you're following along your notes, God is the real hero of the story. Right? God uses a disobedient prophet, a storm, and a brief and begrudging confession of faith to reveal his love and his lordship to a bunch of pagan sailors in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea who did not even see it coming. Right? We're not even to Nineveh yet and already God is saving people because that's who he is. That's his character. That's his heart. He does not wish that any should perish. Right? We're not even to Nineveh yet. And God's using the disobedience of his prophet to save people on the Mediterranean Sea. Mediterranean Sea. One of the points of this story is that God's rescue plan will happen even when his own people run in the opposite direction. Even when his own people disobey him. Even when his own people rebel against him. In fact, God actually uses the disobedience and rebellion of his prophet Jonah to accomplish his plan of rescuing these sailors. Which, by the way, is where the story of Jonah foreshadows God's ultimate rescue plan. Think about it. When God comes to earth in Jesus to rescue sinners who, instead of embracing him, reject him and who ultimately crucify him because they don't like his plan. They don't like his rescue plan. And as Jesus hung on that cross, I'm sure it looked like God's rescue plan had been thwarted from the perspective of the enemy. But it wasn't. Because what nobody knew at the time was that God was actually using the disobedience and rebellion of his own people to accomplish his rescue plan. See, the cross was not just the result of our sin. It's also the means of our salvation. Yes, it was the result of our sin. But it's also the means of our salvation. God used our sin to bring about our salvation because that's how amazing God's grace is. Now, just because God uses our disobedience to further his rescue plan does not mean that there aren't still consequences for our disobedience. We're going to see that next week when we get into chapter 2. There are real consequences for Jonah's disobedience. But here in chapter 1, we are intended to see God's rescue of these sailors despite Jonah's disobedience, which just illustrates how powerful God is and how far-reaching his redemption is which then leads me to invite you to consider four questions and four potential next steps in response to God's word this morning. Question number one, have you and I accepted that God's rescue plan includes us? In other words, despite my sin, despite my rebellion, 
despite my spiritual ignorance, am I willing to receive the forgiveness and new life that God offers me by putting my trust in what he did for me at the cross to rescue me? Right? Just like the sailors in Jonah 1, receiving this gift is as simple as calling out to God. It's not complicated, folks. Romans 10, verse 13, Paul succinctly lays it out for us. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Because in doing that, we're doing a couple of things. We're acknowledging that we're sinners that need to be saved, and we're calling out to the Lord as the one who can do it. It's that simple. Just like the pagan sailors in chapter 1. It's as simple as calling on the name of the Lord, and we will be saved. Maybe today is the day for some of you to call on Jesus and receive what he's done for you. Be reconciled into a relationship with God. Receive the new life that he has for you. A life that will be marked by peace and joy. Doesn't mean he's going to rescue you out of the circumstances that you're in. But he will walk with you. He will walk with you. He will give you a new life on the way to a glorious kingdom that will be forever. Call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Second question is this. Do you and I have God's heart for those he wants to rescue? Do you and I have God's heart for those that he wants to rescue? In other words... Are there any people in my life that I view as Ninevites, but for whom Christ died? And if so, am I willing to ask God to change my heart so that I begin to see these people as dearly loved by him? Right? Maybe today is the day for some of us that God changes our hearts so that we see that person or we see that group of people the way God sees them. As someone God died for as someone God loves, as someone God wants to reach, right? Do you and I have God's heart for those that he wants to rescue? Number three, who are the pre-Christians in our lives that we can pray for and reach out to? Because here's the deal, folks. Who knows how God might already be preparing the hearts of those in our sphere of influence who don't know him if they would just simply have an opportunity to share what God has done for them in Christ, right? We got to see the world and people that way, not just as enemies, but as pre-Christians who just might respond if they had an opportunity to hear. And if you can't think of anybody in your life who's not already a Christian, I would encourage you to ask God to bring someone into your life who doesn't yet know Christ. God loves to answer that question, friends. He loves to answer that question. He loves to answer that prayer. So call out to him. Ask him. Ask him to do that. And then finally, number four, where is the liar syndrome present in our lives? Where is the liar syndrome present in our lives? In other words, is there any truth that God has shown us that we're not yet applying to our lives? And then if there is, then like the sailors in Jonah 1, is there a confession and a commitment that I need to make to God to do whatever I need to do before I walk out of here today? Right? Maybe it's regarding something that God has been speaking to you about for a while, but you just haven't taken that step that you need to take. It's not an information problem. You know exactly what you need to do. You just haven't done it. Right? Maybe it's the step of joining one of our serving teams here at Trinity. The Lord's been speaking to you about this for a while. You just haven't done it. Or maybe it's the step of trusting God with your finances. There's not a lack of information on this point. You know that God owns it all. You just kind of want to hold on to it yourself. Or maybe it's the step of publicly declaring your faith in Christ through public baptism. Maybe it's the step of getting into God's word on a daily basis. Maybe it's the step of, of repenting of some sin. Some sin that God's spirit keeps talking to you about keeps telling you to leave behind, keeps telling you to don't keep going there. It's eating your lunch. It's not good for you. It doesn't glorify me. And you're just kind of like, right? Maybe today is the day that you, you, you repent, you make a commitment. And maybe for some of you, today is the day that you share your burden with one of our prayer team members and allow someone to pray for you about whatever you're going through instead of thinking, I, I got this. Or thinking, you know, between God and me, we got this. When God says, yeah, I, 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 I can save you through Christ. You don't need other people to save you. I save you. But I encourage you. I equip you. I resource you. I sometimes answer prayer through other believers. So for some of you, that's your next step. Stop trying to 
Stop trying to carry the burden that you're walking through alone and let someone pray for you. Or maybe it's some other step that God is calling you to take. But again, most of us, it's not an information problem that's holding us back. It's an action problem. So however you need to take action today, I want to encourage you to, to commit to doing it. And then we're going to stand together and sing praise to the real hero of this story, the one whose purpose of reaching the world cannot, will not be thwarted. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come ahead. I'm going to pray. And again, if you want to slip out into the prayer station during our final song or right after the service, I would encourage you to do so. Let someone pray for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for what you have done for us in Christ. Ah, truly, you are the hero of the story that you could use even our disobedience, our rebellion. To further your kingdom purposes. What a deal. What a great and gracious God you are. Lord, I pray that you would make that grace known to people's hearts even right now. If there are any here who, even in the sound of my voice, are thinking, could I call out to this God and would he save me? Lord, that by your spirit, you would make it clear that that's exactly the truth. That what you've done for us in Christ is sufficient, no matter our past, no matter our moral resume, that when we turn to you, when we look to you, when we call out to you, when we call you Savior and Lord, you save us. You reconcile us to yourself. You adopt us into your family. You fill us with your spirit. You give us new life. You walk with us. Lord, make that truth known to hearts, even in this moment. And then, Lord, the others of us, you, you know where we just need a heart change to, to see people the way you want us to see them. We, we pray that you would do that work. We, we pray that you would help us to have the courage to reach out where you want to open up doors because you want to work. You want to draw people to yourself. I pray that you would help us to, to not be committing the liar syndrome where we just have lots of information and do nothing with it. So Lord, by your spirit, do that work. Renew us. Revive us. Help us. Help us to not just be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. So even in these moments, we invite your spirit to do the work that you and you alone can do so that you become not just the hero of this story, but you become the hero of our lives, the hero of our church. Do that work in Jesus' name. And everyone agreed and said, amen. Let's stand. Let's worship our great God.